now. Um, okay, so today's speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce Eric Auren. Um, and uh, so Eric got his PhD in 1989, I uh, gathered from your webpage in Gothenburg. Then he was a postdoc in Nice, 89, 90. Then a Swedish council researcher in the 90s, from 92 to 98. Subsequently, or partly overlapping maybe, a Nordita fellow, and he was also at the Swedish Institute for Computer Science. Um, and since 2003, he's been a professor at the Royal Institute for Technology, KTH, um, uh, uh, for theoretical biological physics. And in his time since then, he has a various um, visiting appointments and, and distinguished awards, such as the Finland Distinguished Professor 2008 to 13. And he was an adjunct professor in Alto 2014 to 18. And I understand he visits China quite regularly. Um, and we're pleased uh, to have you here today. So if you'd like to share your slides. Then, uh... Yes, thank you very much. Should I start? Thank yes, you for please the go ahead, go also. ahead. Thanks for the introduction and thanks everybody, but especially to Tobias and Maxi for giving me this chance to talk. It's always nice to, to talk again about papers that have been published for a while. This is a stimulus to, uh, to refresh and to, to try to say something new. So I, I appreciate that. Um, the, the work I'm going to tell you about is a, a, a Swedish, Italian, Cuban, uh, Chinese uh, collaboration. And the first author was, uh, my, was my, is my, my collaborator, Hong Li Zeng, who spent uh, a year as, uh, in a sabbatical in the, the pandemic year, as a, in a, at the first half year of the pandemic in a sabbatical in Stockholm. And then we did this work and a few other papers, which are more on the theory side. So I will not really talk about it. I, one has to make a selection, but for those of you more interested in theory and in simulation and checking theories, there are papers which you can follow very easily from the last the one, two years for, by me and, and Hong Li Zeng. Um, well, and as I said, uh, everybody hadn't joined already. I, of course, I'm very happy if anybody inter interrupts me at any time so that it becomes a, a more lively uh, discussion and talk. So please feel free to do that in any way that the uh, seminar organizers feel is, 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 a, is a suitable thing. So uh, I, I will start sharing my screen and show my slides in a moment. Um, uh, so that will come now. Okay, and let me bring uh, this up in a usable format. Okay, so somebody is typing. Yeah, I assume it's not the speaker, or is it the speaker? It is certainly not me. No, no. Can I'm that not, person not please the, either so stop typing or mute themselves? <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> yes, one can hear. Disturb me. But then maybe yeah. they can, maybe even better, they can unmute themselves and say in words what they want to say, if it is to me. If it's well, to somebody then else, <laughs> then please mute and do whatever you want to do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. So um, I, the work I'm going to tell you about uh, the May was published in December. Uh, and uh, it's an application of a theory we've been working on off and on for, for some time, where we have other papers, uh, two data which uh, pertain to the virus that I think needs no, no further introduction in these days. Uh, so my motivation for, uh, for giving the talk in this format is on the one hand, the methods that, that we have used, at least part of the methods that we have used, are of the family that uh, in statistical physics often have the name, the acronym direct coupling analysis. Sometimes you also hear the word inverse easing problem or inverse POTS problem. It has many other uh, more famous applications. I will just pass over one slide on one of them, but uh, I hope to give you a new perspective on these methods. Why, why do they work? At least in some, in some specific applications. Uh, then I will also show you what I find a very interesting and very rich source of data, which is growing really fast and which has not been mined by the uh, statistical physics data science crowd as much as one would have hoped. And uh, the data that we have used is, is from there. It's a GISAID repository, 
which was an initiative to share initially influenza uh, genome or influenza um, genomic information, but it's now become uh, above all a repository for um, genomes and par parts of genomes of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And just to give you an idea, when we published, uh, when, when we sent the last version of this paper, which was published in December, that was in um, kind of in August, we used the cutoff date, which was August the 8th. And at that time we had 50,000 or more, a bit more than 50,000 full length, high quality, as scored by the repository itself, genomes of SARS-CoV-2. So that's 50,000, it's a large number. Today, the number is more than half a million. So it's really quite a lot, and a, even I would say unprecedented in, uh, in genomics and in many other data sources to have such large uh, data being available to anybody in such a short time. And then the last one is the, hopefully we were able to do something which is useful in the pandemic, useful using in the sense that leveraging the tools which are ours and not trying to repeat uh, epidemiology, which of course many of other colleague, colleagues have been doing. And that's hard to say more than the epidemiologists do themselves. So with this uh, short introduction, let me go to the more material slides. And the first one is this one. What is actually evolution? Well, it is that individuals do not change in the, in the genomic setups, but the average properties or the population, which can be, um, which can be visualized as a kind of um, cloud of points in a landscape of possible genotypes, they change. And they can change due to different forces. And the first force, the most uh, famous one is natural selection. This is one, uh, I found it somewhere on Wikipedia. This is of course, Darwin's finches from the Galapagos, which evolved from the same one bird and then differentiated out to, to fill different. Okay, so here it's a fact that you, you come to um, a virus could also have this, but here there was a bird that came to an island where there were no other birds and there were different kinds of things it could eat. And then one type of the birds became better to eat some things and some other type of birds became better to eat other things. The one to the, to the left, for instance, obviously has a very a much stronger beak. So it's able to eat more harsher grains and, and nuts and whatever. This is one force, natural selection. Next one is mutations. So if there is no changes, if everybody would remain exactly the same, if every from passage from one gen generation to another one, no gen genotype ever changes, well, then there is no possibility for um, natural selection to move anything because there's no variability. And here are two, uh, two um, uh, different uh, illustrations of the concept of mutations on very different time scales and also very different scales uh, in, uh, in organisms. If you look at the, to the left, there you see that there is a, a, a mutation in a tulip and um, very likely in, um, in a stem cell. So it affects only one of the leaves of the tulip. And, and uh, it, it's not probably not inherited. So that when this tulip, then if, it's, uh, if it would have seeds, which usually commercial tulips don't have, but that, that's another issue. Then the next one will probably be red again. But here you can see that there was a mutation somewhere in the, in the bulb. And it led to that this tulip had this different, the different coloring in one of the leaves. So it's on one individual and it's on the, um, it's not in the germ line. It's not going to be inherited, likely so at least. Uh, and it only affects in this case, part of the body. Now, if it is in the germ line, then it will of, of course uh, affect also the descendants of the, um, it will be inherited in the next generation. And then uh, the, this particular, organism uh, could have many descendants that have an evolutionary advantage and eventually this mutation could then be taking over the population or it could also be that it's not very uh, advantageous or it's deleterious and then it would die out. Now in a population 
um, eventually, if it's a mutation will reach to a high uh, frequency, one says that it reaches fixation and different um, organisms that are more or less closely related or more distantly related very often have um, parts of the genomes, in particular the proteins, the, part, the genes that code for the proteins, which are evidently inherited from an ancestor and are rather similar. This is a table, a random table of amino acids from different uh, versions of the same protein essentially in different organisms. And with a little help of uh, shifting the table, it's called the multiple sequence alignment, one gets these um, symmetric tables. When there's, a, when there's a minus sign, it means that there is a deletion inserted. That means that this particular, um, um, let's say the, the one to the bottom, the, the furthest down to the bottom, has a several free, in fact, one, uh, one um, amino acid or one codon deletions. That means it's shorter. So if you just put it on top of the others, it wouldn't match up very well. But if you, if you allow yourself a little bit of shrinkage or, or inserting a little bit of space, there is now well-established software tools that produce these kind of tables for you. And this uh, done this way, it's quite obvious even to the eye that there is a large amount of similarity in most, in many of the columns, not in all, but in many of the columns look very similar. That means that they have inherited the same amino acid in the same position. And these are then on the population level. So, all the organisms essentially in one species will then share, if you look at the fifth column, either a G or a T or a V. And those are the only three possibilities in column five. And then you have another column further down, uh, which has another color. And in that case, it's a Q or an L and a T. And you can see that in this case, there is both different distribution of frequencies in this family of proteins, but there's also some kind of pairwise correlation between the two columns. So it's G seems to go very often with the Q and the T goes with an L and then, or it goes with another T, and, but the V goes with the T. So there's a non-trivial correlation between these two columns. Okay. A third force of evolution is recombination, which has another name when it uh, is applied to, uh, to human and to higher organisms, namely sex. So you have uh, the effect that you have two different um, sexes and that they um, share the uh, ge genetic information to the next generation so that children have in human and in, in mammals in general, will inherit half of the genomic material from the mother and half from the father. There's also more recombination than this. Even in, uh, in human, there's a recombination between the two chromosomes in each of the uh, mother and the father. So sometimes technically recombination is used or crossover is used also for the other sense. But the general effect is that you have share, uh, a share of geno genomic information. So if you have a certain property that expands and takes over everything else, it does not have to be so that it's a strictly inherited parents to children to grandchildren, because these children and grandchildren also have lots of mixtures from other things. It uh, simply means that of the grandchildren of the parent of the grandparent that had the beneficial mutation, those grandchildren that inherit this, this um, mutation, they have a a, a increased tendency to, uh, uh, to survive and prosper just because this variation doesn't mean that they have to inherit all the other generations that the grandfather has. And there is also um, recombination or sex in practically every organism. This is an illustration of one of the three forms of, of bacterial sex. It's an illustration of conjugation, which is well established in, in E. coli, for instance, which is a kind of one-sided sex one type of the bacteria gives genetic material to the other one, but still is a sharing of and a transmission, a lateral or horizontal transmission of genetic, um, um, let's say, software or code or whatever is the, you want to use the information. 
Now, recombination is common in life. And there is a well-known hypothesis by the person who discovered that uh, uh, all organisms in, uh, in, uh, on Earth can be uh, sorted into uh, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, that it was extremely common in the, uh, in the origin of life. I think this is still quite um, a, a bit uh, controversial if that's so, but it's certainly so that if you go, uh, if you go to mammals, there is no mammal uh, alive today, uh, which does not, uh, well, all mammals, they reproduce sexually. Uh, birds mainly so, but there is a, you can find asexual reproduction in chicken and turkey and related, um, uh, and, and related birds. And apparently that is a, um, also a practical problem for the poultry industry because these, uh, uh, these um, asexually reproducing, uh, reproducing eggs are not good for eating. And uh, generally the next generation is not very healthy either. And if you go down further to lizards, there are several species of lizards that mainly uh, multiply asexually and bacteria and yeast, you have a mixture of sex and, and and reproduction without sex. But still, you have reproduction in, as far as I know, uh, in all kinds of, uh, of life, including several viruses. It's well known since more than 20 years that at least in the lab, the coronaviruses, uh, the um, species in that family have a lot of recombination. And that's uh, due to the way, the particular way in the how the reproduction of the, um, of the RNA happen in, in that set. There's a kind of switching from one template to another template, which can then lead to a mixture. If you have a co-infection of two, uh, of two um, um, species or two, uh, two strains of, uh, of a coronavirus, you can, out, you can have a mixture of the two species, which is the kind of viral sex. Now, how much that happens, that of course depends on how often these two uh, viral strains will infect at the same time, the same host. You must meet to have sex. And that's also true for, for viruses. It's true for all these organisms uh, considered here. Now, just as an aside, if you don't have sex, what happens? Well, here's a nice illustration, which I found from a, a, a book illustrating the different kinds of of uh, unicorns. Uh, at some point, apparently, it was believed that um, uh, the unicorns were a real, a real kind of species, and there were scholars collecting the different kinds of uh, unicorns. Uh, and uh, well, it's known from children's stories that they do not reproduce sexually. So here there's a nice example of an Italian unicorn, which actually has two horns. It's called the Pirasoipi. And, and it also has a different kind of fur. So, I mean, those things don't exist today in today's children's soil, so they uh, died out together. So here's a difference. Here, since they do not mix the gen genomic material in the next generation, you will not find a later unicorn with two horns, but with the same kind of, of uh, very uh, soft, uh, fur that uh, is typical or even very polished fur that is typical of the unicorns as you as we perceive them today. Of course, this not now illustrates what you can find in properties of, of um, um, especially bacteria, but also other species that that multiply asexually generally. And it's well known that asexual reprodu reproduction is faster because you don't have to have a male. You can just go from mother to two daughters instead of mother to one daughter and, uh, and, and one son. But it tends to accumulate more errors. So that is presumably the overall reason why, why the asexual reproduction mode of reproduction gets less and less common. The higher you go in the tree of life and the more complicated are the organisms. Okay, on a, on a higher, on, on a general level. So statistical genetics of which we, we worked on, on these papers is the general understanding of population genetics. So the distribution of genotypes in a population in analogy with statistical physics, both equilibrium and non-equilibrium. And it has a very long history starting with Fisher in 1920, which I, who I believe was the first one to publish a paper connecting phenomena in population genetics to uh, um, diffusion equations. 
Um, there was more papers by Fisher and Wright in the 20s and 30s, different aspects of this. There's a famous paper by Kalmogorov in the mid 30s, uh, deriving this uh, um, diffusion approximation for the first time correctly with the, uh, with the correct um, um, dependence of the, uh, of the diffusion coefficients on frequencies. And it, it's been a popular um, field of study of, uh, in statistical physics for quite some time. So among the many people who worked on this, and presumably several in the audience, I would be surprised otherwise, but say, let's say some of the um, more well-known and non-American in the slightly older generation would be Luca Pelitti and Michael Lessig. Well, of course, there are many others. Three concepts from statistical genetics, which will be important in the, in the following is linkage equilibrium. That is what happens when the genetic variants or which are known in, bi in biological language as alleles at different loci, these are the positions where they can vary, which can, depending on the context, be a single nucleotide, it can be a codon. So, uh, coding for one amino acid, which is three nucleotides. It could be a, loci, a locus can refer to a whole gene or maybe even a cluster of genes. But let's say from the modern point of view where genomic information is plentiful and accurate, um, loci and allele, locus and allele more and more refer to single nucleotide positions at single nucleotide accuracy and which nucleotide you can find at that position. So if you have a lot of recombination, so there's a lot of, of changes, then you would have a strong tendency at the variance at different loci to be independent across the population. So linkage equilibrium says that the two, um, the distribution of the two alleles, the two point distribution of alleles at two loci factorize into the one locus, the product of the one locus distribution. So just for context, in human, uh, more or less, you have 100 uh, recombination events per generation, so that you have one, uh, more or less a, a, a child is made out of 100 different stretches from the, uh, from the mother on the father, where it's alternatively one and the other, which means that in some sense, recombination in human is, is a rather fast process, but it's not infinitely fast. Now, linkage disequilibrium is a general term saying everything which is not linkage equilibrium. So there is the distributions of pairwise or multi-wise distribution of alleles at two or more loci are not independent. And this can be due to either that there is a fitness advantage to have certain kinds of combinations of alleles at two or more positions. It can also be due to inheritance. That means by chance, some of the alleles have changed in one branch of the, uh, or one part of the population. And this part of the population does not exchange genomic um, uh, material with the rest of the population. Then you can also find a um, non-factorizable probability distributions in the population, but it will not then be due to fitness effects, but to inheritance. Now, quasi-linkage equilibrium is a specific part of the linkage equilibrium phase, which is in some sense quite similar to linkage equilibrium, but still a little bit different. So sex and recombination is not infinitely fast. There are still correlations between the alleles in different loci, but still the recombination efficiently mixes the population so it's not the, you, 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 you do not have separately um, de developing clones or phylogenetically separated uh, organisms that do not um, exchange in, um, genomic material by recombination. They just do not ex uh, exchange it so quickly. And uh, in this, um, this phase of quasi-linkage equilibrium, close to linkage equilibrium, but still having some traces left of fitness variations, though not much of inheritance, it was discovered by the uh, rather famous population geneticist Kimura in the mid 60s, and uh, was taken up especially by, by Richard Neher and Boris Schreiman in two papers um, around to 2010, 
And then we have been following uh, in the footsteps of these great men. And uh, it, it's also now become, um, there's also now other papers in the, in, on the same lines from other groups. So it is a, the quasi-linkage equilibrium is an interesting uh, phase. And one of the reasons it is interesting is on the next slide and is the following one. The stationary distribution of the quasi-linkage equilibrium, that means of the, um, of the genotypes over the population is a distribution that we all know quite well from, um, from, st from equilibrium statistical mechanics. Now, of course, these are not systems in equilibrium. These are in ma on many levels, non-equilibrium systems. But the outcome, and I will get a little bit into the theory later, the outcome of, these, um, of the uh, changes of the population is such that it has, um, the uh, distribution is well captured by an easing or POTS-like model where there are additive effects, which are not necessarily small. This would be like the first linear term, which are like uh, external fields. And there are synergistic effects or epistasis in biological language, which are like the interactions between the um, variations of alleles, in this case at Toulouse-I uh, labeled I and J. So XI here goes over the possible alleles at locus I, and that could be just two, then one often called a major mi minor. It could be any of the four nucleotides, if it's on nucleotide accuracy, so then it's ACTG. It could be any of the 20 um, amino acids, or it could be a collection of actually observed variants at that locus, which could then be any number, let's say anything from two to, well, not infinity, of course, but, uh, but uh, let's say there could be a catalog of possible genetic variants, let's say in this protein, which could then be more than 20. And J is the same thing for another one. And J, I, J then is a way of taking into account the statistical dependency as observed in the population between covariations at these two low sides. And the, uh, the, the really nice thing from the, uh, from the point of view of statistical physics is that this is not just curve fitting and a model. There are certain specific limits in which the stationary distribution of an evolving population in fact has this term. And you can, you can make a connection of these parameters JIJ, which describe the data, to parameters, other parameters that will then describe an evolving population. So JIJ is related to uh, the synergistic fitness effects that you have a um, you, that you have an advantage of having certain joint vari variations, certain pairs together at I and J, but it's not exactly the same. So if you put up a mathematical model of an evolving population, you will typically have some fitness parameters uh, that uh, I will call later F. So let's say there's an FIJ parameter and the FIJ parameter in the dynamics is related to the JIJ parameter that you find in the stationary probability distribution, but it's not exactly the same. So there's something like a, what plays the role of a temperature in this case, there's kind of prop proportionality constant, which in fact is not exactly the same, for all pairs I and J. So there are other complications here that we don't have in physics, but still you have a proportionality between these observed uh, or that can be observed parameters J, I, J and the model parameters that would then, or the underlying biological causes of these variabilities. So, um, and um, there, it's been a, a large uh, amount of effort in statistical physics to, um, to determine such parameters, these JIJ from data, from tables, from, uh, from multiple sequence alignments, very often of proteins, can also be on other scales, or for, for RNA, it can also be from pairs of proteins. Uh, one of the persons who has been a real parameter, and this is Martin Veit in Paris, and uh, I'm, they wrote together with other groups in Paris a really nice review, uh, which is more on the biological side, what they have used uh, it for. 
There is an also extremely nice uh, methodological uh, review uh, from three or four years ago now by uh, Johannes Berg and Ricardo Zecchina and their, um, I guess, joint store, Johannes Berg student, Gian, Gian Chao. Uh, so that uh, is remarkably complete in all ways in which one can uh, take the multiple sequence alignment and a, with a moderate computational effort and good accuracy actually determine the JIJs. Now, that has a prehistory. Even I wrote a paper on this more than 10 years ago, and there's a, one of these uh, famous um, long reviews from, uh, from the statistics or machine learning side by Michael Jordan and, and Wainwright, which is now actually 13 years old. And there's a long literature in statistics on these methods. Of course, you would say that in, uh, from elementary statistics is if you have uh, N samples from this probability distribution, the default way of finding the parameters is by, um, by maximum likelihood. But that's really difficult in the sizes which are of interest in, uh, in these. You have uh, typically for a protein hundreds or could be thousands of positions. And you, have, uh, you can have, at least for the protein case, you can have 20 different uh, symbols on each position. And to solve uh, the computational effort in, in doing um, a maximum likelihood is uh, not insignificant. Okay, that is of course a moving target. The, the, the better computers, the smarter, the, the larger computers, the faster. But still there are other ways which are, which are much more uh, compute efficient and which uh, have been dominating the field. Also people would like to have fast answers um, and uh, when they have been checked, they are usually, when these methods work, more or less as good as, uh, as maximum likelihood. You don't get much more. But I will, I will skip these, uh, these um, methods, DCA, uh, on how they actually work. And to remind you, I guess most of you must have heard some kind of talk on this. I will remind you of the great success in this, which is from predicting properties of protein structures uh, from multiple sequence alignments. That's uh, initiated by Terry Waugh and Martin White now 10 years ago. So if you, if you have this kind of, of uh, multiple sequence alignment, you run the, uh, the one of the, your favorite DCA method and you try to use the highest ranking pairs. That means the pairs which have the strongest inferred coupling, whatever this coupling is, the JIJ from the data and you take that as the measure of statistical dependency, using then some computational, non-trivial computational means in, in the intermediate, intermediate process. Instead of compared, of course, you would compare that of just taking the correlations, directly computing the correlations from the multiple sequence alignment. Then it turns out that these, uh, this method of using the JIJ as the predictor of what is likely to be a direct influence of these two amino acids on each other. And the most likely influence is that they're actually close in space and can, can sort of either help or, or distract each other. Then this JIJ is a much better prediction. Now, unfortunately this, or fortunately or unfortunately, depends on the point of view, but in this particular um, um, application, which uh, in which many of us invested quite some time, has in the last two, three, three years been taken over completely by AlphaFold and, and Google, who directly learn a model going from the multiple, no, from the sequences themselves without going to a multiple sequence alignment table to the full protein structure with all the bells and whistles to it. And that's possible because the answer is known in this case, and you can train the, uh, your methods to that answer. The answer is crystallized protein structures of which there is much, much less than the number of, of, um, of protein sequences, but still really a lot. So if you don't have these kind of, of uh, training sets, well, gold standard training sets, as they say in bioinformatics, you have to do other things. Okay, so now I will be, do a little bit of theory. And I guess uh, I am already um, halfway through the time, I guess, or maybe a little bit more even. So this will give you a flavor that if you, if you write a normal kind of statistical physics model, which will then involve fitness, mutations, and recombination, 
fitness and mutations are like one genome events and recombination is like a two genome event. So it's very much like a collision in, uh, in, uh, in the theory of dense gases. And if you assume that the collision rate is much higher than the other one, the collision rate here is a re recombination rate, which is one overall parameter R, you can work out a stationary state of this, um, uh, of these, um, uh, the probability P of G, which is the distribution in the population over genotypes, uh, which after some uh, massaging has the type that G of G, which is the, what you can observe in the population. So maybe I'll, I'll highlight it here, okay? So, oh, sorry, now this was something here. So here, the, this, this parameter, which you can determine from the data, it's proportional to the um, epistatic fitness parameter. That means how much it actually helps the, um, in, in, in improving the chances of the individual to survive in natural selection to have this particular combination at low psi i and j. And the proportionality constant is one over the um, the uh, recombination rate and a particular quantity which describes more or less how far are these particular, these, these two loci i and j from each other on the genome and how likely is it that the recombination event happened in between these two and not somewhere else. So that this is the temperature-like uh, quantity, which is the one over R C i j. That's more or less, it plays the role of a temperature in this case. Right, so this means that if you if you can estimate these in some other way, or if you say I'm only looking at uh, loci which anyway are very far from each other in the genome, so I can assume that this CIJ in fact then is one half, then I have a proportionality between the effects which are observed from the data from the snapshots of the sequences and the uh, mechanisms which must have given rise to these data. So there's a way of inferring the fitness the pairwise fitness parameters from data. If you then run, you select, you get the data. And uh, just to say that we had some, uh, we and others have looked on this on the level of whole genome and bacteria. Uh, since this is going to be um, recorded, you will have that for the reference later. And you can, if you want to, you can uh, you can look up these uh, these these papers and. The latest one was a not very um, optimistic one for E. coli, which happens to have little recombination from a PhD thesis from the group of Martin White. And then these other, the green ones, it seemed to work. These are also bacteria with a, which are known to have a lot of recombination. The red ones are where it didn't work. And that is for these, these two cases are bacteria which are known to have not a lot of recombination. So um, in the last time, I will, uh, um, I will tell you a little bit more about um, uh, how these uh, things apply for um, data, which you can uh, get from the GISAID repository on SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so we did uh, the, the published data is based, the published paper is based on 50, more than 50,000 whole genome sequences, but there are now many more. So, and they are really increasing quite quickly now on the, on the GISET repository as sequencing efforts, of course, have, have, um, have increased. Uh, and here is uh, two slide, uh, one slide showing something. I think this is, should be known to everybody these days that these coronaviruses have a specific shape with these spikes, which are certain proteins called spike that stick out of them when they, uh, when they exist at vir viral particles. They are like coronaviruses are mostly around 30,000 kilobase pairs in length. And they have a genomic organization dominated by a long, um, or you could say one or two large multi-protein genes called normally ORF1AB, which are transcribed early and which then split into many different kinds of genes, which uh, 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 which have uh, names like NSP2, NSP3, and so on. Then there are some other genes which are by themselves, and they come towards the end of the uh, uh, of the genome. Uh, that means um, towards 30,000 and not towards zero, because 
transcription starts from zero and goes to 30,000 in this direction. And that includes both S and um, other genes such as ORF3A, which is a, a gene uh, unique to, uh, to the SARS family uh, and ORF8 and, and other genes. And of course, there are really a lot of genes. This is a nice uh, uh, illustration, which is already one year old on how many they are. It, and of course, if you plot it today, you have an even larger cloud. So the result, if you run uh, DCA on 50,000 uh, genomes, um, is that you find a, and, and you look then for the, uh, the highest rank co-varying co one, the ones with the largest JIJ, you find this uh, rather short list in the end, which is typical for the DCA as a way of data processing. You usually have very many possibilities in an intermediate stage and you end up with very few. And you have uh, the first one is here between uh, possible changes in a locus, which is around the nucleotide position 1000 and another one at 25,000, which are then between uh, positions in genes NSP2, which is inside ORF1AB and a position in ORF3A. And so it goes down. What's interesting is that if you do this uh, um, uh, over time, so you collect the data, which is what we started in April and then in May and then in August. This is, uh, you'll find that the, the ranks of these mostly uh, highly uh, statistically related pairs, according to the DCA analysis, is rather stable over time. While correlations uh, um, among the same positions, so you look at the most highly you, you look at the correlations between those same genes, they go up and down much more in rank. And this has continued afterwards. So if you go from these uh, 50,000 to what there was in, uh, the, in GISAID at the end of last year, you will have um, a similar picture that the rank of the, uh, of the most highly uh, interacting pairs, uh, according to the DCA analysis, PLM, which is written here in the scores is one way of computing uh, the DCA scores. While if you, the correlation analysis looks much more random and changing much more quickly. And you can also do these kind of, of visualizations on where are these highly, um, uh, that this is another way of presenting the same data as in the table a few slides uh, before. So you have kind of annotate on which are the genes and where do these things go. Uh, and that also, although that's a little, little less clear to see, this has also remained more or less the same when we you add more data. Although this, uh, there is a threshold effect, and, but you can see that there are quite some, of course there are more predictions, which depend on where you put the threshold and a little bit on how the coloring is done, but you can see that there is a reproduction between these two. So um, here uh, we, to do something. So there I have to thank them, Tobias and Maxi. I, we decided that we have to do something new or I have to do something new for this. So of course, it's now very uh, in the news very much, the uh, so-called UK variant, which uh, scientifically is known as the B1, B117 variant. And you can look up the original definition, which is public, which is in a document from Public Health England uh, from December last year. It was discovered in, in September, but it was defined as a variant of concern in December. And according to that document, um, this, um, this uh, variant, the UK variant is defined by 23 mutations of which 17 are non-synonymous. So they change the amino acids that's in table one in this document. And six of them are synonymous. So they do not change any proteins. Now it is a fact, at least in Sweden, the UK variant, when they say it's detected, they only mean that they have detected the variant in spike gene. They sometimes do also some checks on the N gene, but that's it. And, uh, they, and as far as I've, found out this is the case wherever this uh, is reported. It's the same in England. It's the same in Denmark. 
I don't know directly of Spain, but it can surely be found out. And the reason is that to find it out quickly, what people are mainly using to be able to track it in sort of real time is PCR with primers, which are, uh, or pri kits of primers, which cover things in spike. And they might also cover things in N and maybe elsewhere, but they certainly don't cover everything. So we thought it was a nice exercise to take the uh, current uh, set of genomes in GISAID and just check what's the frequency of the major allele at these 23 positions uh, over time, since the data also includes the collection time and the, and the tide, of course, also the date of deposition to the, to the uh, repository, but the most uh, more interesting one is the data when the sample has been taken. So you can classify all samples in January, all samples in February, all samples and so on until February or March this year. And then you can plot what is the frequency of the major allele. And if there is no mutation, if everybody is the same, but then this frequency should be around one. And if an, if a, uh, if a, um, a mutation appears and which grows and everybody take over at the same time, well, then you would see a, a number of these things going down at the same time. So this is what you do. This is what you get. This is very fresh data, which we got just a few days ago. This is what it looks like. So here are the frequencies of these 23 mutations as defined in the UK variant report from uh, uh, Public Health England versus time from February last year to February this year. And what you can see is that for some odd reason, one of them, which is the one of the non-synonymous ones, the one in M, it has a completely different behavior. Why that is, we don't know, but the others seem to start taking off in September, October in the, in the whole genome data, which of course is consistent with this um, variant be, having been found for the first time in England in September. Then it went up to uh, the things published in January. This is by month. So it's not quite so that they are, um, they, it's line, but there's only one data point per month. So from December to January, they really came down to that half of the samples collected in the word and deposited in GISAID with that collection date um, had that um, had those mutations. And then it stayed more or less the same in among those for the last month, for those that are deposited in GISAID. Now, there it can be some traces of recombination on the other 22 low side, because of course they don't fall exactly on top of each other. And these are made, this data for the, uh, for the last months is, uh, about almost 100,000 samples per month. So it is quite a lot, but we didn't yet analyze that. So anyway, the, but the, the take home message is that it seems like at least this variant is not spreading. So it cannot be doing a lot of recombination because then presumably it would have lost more of its, um, more of its synonymous variants and the ones which are outside spike, which is a problem, but that we, um, at least we have the data to think about. So of course, um, in, if I now go to the outlook, um, the idea that this can happen is not completely new. Um, uh, let's say, uh, I will say a little bit about theory and issues in the, the last minutes that I have left. Okay, so one of course is the formula which, which uh, I flashed on the previous screen, which says that the, uh, the data parameters that describe the data distribution, these are the JIJs on the left, that they are proportional to the fitness variants, which are the FIJ, which are on the right. Uh, there is a uh, assumptions uh, on this. And the main assumption more or less is around the fact that uh, it has to be, uh, JIJ has to be small. These has to be small deviations from a factorized model. So in fact, this means that the, whatever it is, the fitness variant FIJ, which one could assume could be kind of has a natural variability, it can be maybe some maximum, some, some minimum, but that should not really depend so much on 
how far they are on the genome, at least if they fall in different genes. Okay, if you have an interaction between one gene and another gene, and in, in the sense that the covariation between the proteins produced by those genes have an effect, it doesn't shouldn't depend so much that they are close on the genome or they are far from the genome. So the FIJ should not have a systematic variation in the IJ, while the denominator, the CIA, definitely do, does. If you have little recombination between loci I and J, you would have a small CIJ, and then you start to lose the condition in which the analysis, uh, the derivation has been made. So an interesting question for the future for the theory is how to basically infer the fitness parameters in the population the fitness population in the mechanics the driving the evolution of the population from the variability in the population, that means from GIJ or whatever other uh, information you want to collect, um, if these conditions are not satisfied. So maybe they can be satisfied for most pairs, but not for some pairs, which are maybe the ones which are strong uh, effects. Okay, and of course this issue comes together with the effect, I mean, one, if you can have, that the left-hand side is small either because these FIJs there are particularly big, or you can also have it that they are small because uh, the CIJ is particularly small. So in both cases, how to infer the parameters of the evolving population when you cannot say that with to good accuracy there is a quasi-linkage equilibrium distribution, it's an issue and it's a theory issue which I hope that we will continue to work on. I think it's an important one. Uh, uh, and then you can have this effect of, of competition between a clonal competition, and maybe this is what's happening now in the, in the SARS, in the, in the COVID-19 pandemic, that you have a clone of the UK, the UK clone that is uh, taking over the population. Um, and I, I think though that it is interesting that the data showing that you have a rise of the minor allele in all the places defined in that document from England Public Health has not been available and to, at least I have not seen it at all. So the, all the conclusions about the growth, which has appeared to be correct, but all the conclusion about the growth of the UK variant are basically based on PCR signals from Spike and some other places. And then the variations on the other ones seem to be hitchhiking on those. So you can have, in theory, you can have a, a, a threshold um, between if recombination is big, you should have a quasi linkage equilibrium. So you have a, a, a factorization of two genome distributions and you have one genome distributions more or less Gibbs-Boltzmann-like. Uh, and then if you, have a, a, if you have little recombination, well then you, you probably have a support on different clones that do not interact very much. And of course, also then the two genome distribution doesn't factorize very much. Now there are, you can make parallels to, to phenomena in spin glasses, but those are of course phenomena in the equilibrium theory for the Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution itself. Here, the more the question is, it, these are non-equilibrium problems where either they behave as if they have a Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution or they do not. So it's a kind of, it's a same picture, but a, it's a different interpretation. And well, we would like to do more on the data, um, uh, which we have to some extent, maybe I'll skip this for the moment. And of course, it is interesting that uh, in our analysis, this particular protein comes up a lot. And if you then dig in, you can see, you can find many in many ways that this, this particular protein is um, both in the previous SARS and in the new SARS um, quite uh, closely um, implicated in uh, the more, um, the worst forms of, of COVID-19 as, as a disease. So there's, there's a hope that one can use this also as a way in the future. But so far, there has not been any drugs to this ORF3. So we have not been able to do something useful in this one. And I hope I can stop now and I haven't gone very much over time. So thanks are due to my collaborators. So Hongli Zeng, Vito Dicchio, Edwin Rodriguez and Kaisa Turel. 
I should also thank Boris Schreiman for a discussion some years back, which was very useful. And Martin White, who developed a method that we used in the paper. I, I skipped that over today together with Edwin Rodriguez, and which was quite useful in the analysis. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> well, thank you, Eric. Um, yeah. At least I kept in within one hour. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. That's perfect. We, we have time for, for questions. So would anybody like to ask any questions or make any comments? Just unmute yourself and and shoot. Oh, no questions, like Finland. <laughs> no, and apologies to any Finns who are in the audience. It's uh, just possible. I have a very general question, Eric. Yeah? I mean, uh, you presented that as an inverse problem in which you are trying to I mean, learn about all these parameters, the AIJ or whatever, but as you stated and at the end, you, you also mentioned, this is a non-equilibrium problem. So is there any uh, prediction or any uh, interesting uh, quantity that one should monitor, which depends on time from the theoretical side? Yeah, uh, uh, the problem is that you were, uh, yeah. Um, if you um, if you were able to monitor uh, the genome distribution in a, a given population over time, you would have the uh, uh, you would you would have the problem of inferring parameters from a time series. And uh, in the class of inferring parameters, um, this is much more efficient when you can do it. You can, we have done some papers already of, with Hongli Zeng actually also, when she was my student, that's not, and Miko Alava and others, and also others, John Hertz worked a lot on this also. So if you are, if you have the, and, and this has many applications to neuroscience, for instance. So basically, if you can monitor the system that you're interested in over time, and you know the, 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 the uh, configuration, say, of, if there is only one or zero, it's like the icing spins, how they change in a spin system over time. Then, uh, and if you know that the evolution law of this spin system is something like a kinetic easing model, which more or less is what these evolution models are. Okay, there are differences, but let's, uh, let's say in that class. Then that is, if you have the time order data, you can do it much better that way. The problem with the genomic data is that up to now, almost always, one had only snapshots of the population at one time. So one had to infer the parameters of the dynamics from the stationary pro uh, population. That's definitely true for proteins, where you have the different sequences of the similar proteins that you can find today, and they are the result of millions of years of evolution. It was true up to just a few years ago for bacteria, uh, for whole genome sequencing efforts where you had some sequencing of samples in a population and that population had then evolved. It's almost becoming to be not true in the kind of data which I showed to you in said, if one could restrict it more. So let's say we, if I would have the genomes sequenced in Mallorca or let's say in Barcelona, which probably has more cases, so in Barcelona over time, and if one had the statistics of all the genomes over time sequenced in Mallorca or in Stockholm over time, one could do better. But we don't have that data. At least it's not very easy to get. Okay, thanks. Any other questions or comments? I don't see anybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, if that's I must the have case, answered everything or the other. That appears, the appears opposite. to be the case. <laughs> um, well, in that case, we thank uh, Eric again. Thank you. This is a bit, uh, it's always a bit strange. Now we have to just kind of hit the red button, right? But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, once, it's, once you stop recording, you stop recording. Yeah, well, that also, but then everybody just disappears, right? But that's, that's yes. I think, all yeah. we can do. We can't, we can't have a coffee now, really, in, no. a, in a normal way. That's true. Right. So thank you again, and thank uh, you very much for the opportunity. For and um, thanks, thank Eric. you. Yeah.
Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.